first, first off, who are you? I am Jello Biafra, and I still won't go away. That same Jello Biafra you've had on what fourteen other times, and each time somebody sneaks me back on your show, like the producer of Oprah, who had no idea it was me when she booked me in a second time with Tipper Gore, and I caught Tipper lying on the air and humiliated both her and Oprah in the process. Yes, it's Dead Kennedy's Jello Biafra. It's one time mayoral candidate, spoken word saboteur, and lard and. Biafra albums with DOA, No Means No, Mojo Nixon, Tumor Circus, and current band the Guantanamo School of Medicine, who even has this new album out, Tea Party Revenge Porn. Look at it for it in your favorite store in a while, because the hard copies still aren't done. But luckily, in this case, the digital age was my friend, and I could still get this album out before our so-called election last November 3rd. And uh, some people said, oh, yeah, but that whole album's about Trump. It's already old. No, it's not. It's the whole phenomenon. Trump is only the phrase for Satan's comb over. That's worldwide. Tea Party revenge porn. The Tea Party people aren't going away. They're just wearing MAGA hats now. And they're arming themselves and getting more stupid, more intolerant, more crazy, and more violent. So this is going to go on for a long time to come. It's not as though global warming or climate collapse, as I call it, has suddenly ended either. That's what the last big gulp song is about. Or the voyeurs who slow traffic now just can't, you know, and you see a lot of this on the internet too. Ooh, ooh, maybe there's a car crash. I'll slow down and stuff. Let's go stare at bloody dead people. That's another song on there. Taliban USA, that's actually, I'd never gone after the anti-abortion zealots in this country before, whose real purpose, of course, they don't give a damn about the unborn once they're born. They hate kids. They just want to beat up on them and force them to go to religious school and not give them any money to eat or anything, or the mother can stay home with a the kid. They're actually anti-life, anti-quality life. But now that we have a 6-3 majority of not just far right wing pro corporate extremists, but religious fanatics on the Supreme Court. Taliban USA, I mean, sometimes I wonder whether I should quit writing this stuff because it keeps coming true. And you are back on the Nardwar the Human Serviette show for part two, part two, Jello. Yeah, I mean, my mind is starting to go. We're all getting old. I'd forgotten that. And I have a gift for you right now. This is for, for Jello Biafra for returning to the Nardwar the Human Serviette show. The record. <laughs> oh, my God. I've never seen that one before either. And what's the record called? How to live with yourself or what to do until the psychiatrist comes. I love this illustration. Very kitschy period piece. But my God by Dr. Murray Banks. I have not heard of Dr. Murray Banks. I mean, a lot of these records like this from late 50s, early to mid 60s, a lot of them were how you could improve yourself through hypnosis. And I have a bunch of them, especially this guy Ravine, and I've never had the nerve to play one. What happens if I fall asleep during it and get hypnotized against my will and come out a more normal, better person? You'd never Ravine. have me on again. I wouldn't be interesting anymore. Well, Ravine, a Canadian. Unfortunately, he has passed away, but there is the son of Ravine continuing on. Jello, I was curious. I also have this record right here. Do you know anything about this record? Okay, I have one of those records. It's something to do with construction, obviously. Maybe even noise reducers, maybe something else. It's one of those corporate records that might have been meant as a, a giveaway either to people who work with them. I mean, sometimes in the commercial end, you'd get things like the Frito Twist. Or, oh, yeah, the Rock Drill Shake. There you go. They're a drill company. How could I forget? Mario Pagato gives us seven instruments and one rock drill, and they aren't even calling themselves Throbbing Gristle or the Haters. Wow. 
I don't remember it being terribly rocking, to be honest. I do have that record. I have to play it again. Uh, I hope I filed it under Atlas Copco or we're out of luck here. But uh, yeah, I only found out fairly relatively recently, sadly, after that uh, research publications book called Incredibly Strange Music came out. And I'm in volume two talking about all kinds of weird and unusual and incredibly strange records and genres. And little did I know at the time or anybody working on the book, V Vale or the rest, that there's a whole other incredibly demented genre of records that I have a few of them now, I call them corporate sales convention records. They were they, basically what they are is recordings where a corporation, one of those we love so much, would hire a Broadway composer, hire a musical troupe to compose and then perform an entire full length musical about how great the corporation is for like, sales executives when they're away from their wives at a convention on how to sell more stuff for the company. And there's a lot of stuff on there. One album by somebody is called Everything's Coming Up Profits. Well, and, that's what I was going to ask you about, Jello. Yeah, is yeah. this one of those records? This isn't really a corporate sales convention record, is it? It's close. There's a gray area. And there's purists in this regard, too. And... um I think it fits personally, but it might have been more of like an advertising one. I mean, the best giveaway one like that I've ever heard, and maybe it was at shoe stores or a department store, was for Adler socks. Have you ever heard that one? No. It's called Do the Adler Sock, and the people who did it are on pebbles and stuff. It's the denims that 60s garage band, only it's more of a stomping, twisty kind of thing, might be a little earlier than the one that's on Pebbles. I mean, they, they made a bunch of cool records, but the Adler Sock one is by far the best one they ever did. In addition to being all about, come on, everybody, we're doing the sock and stuff. It's a really good, like highly DJable, get the dance floor going kind of a song. I mean, there's even ones like there's a, uh, a couple of them that Paul Revere and the Raiders did for, I think, Chevy cars. I mean, there's SS396 is one of theirs, split on the other side with the circle, you know, the C-Y-R-K-L-E band doing Corvair, baby, and stuff. So that was probably, I would guess it was given away at car dealers or something to get kids who couldn't even know how to drive yet to come pick those records up. So then when they turn 16, they want their rich parents to buy them an SS396 or a Corvair so they could go crash and stuff. I don't know. I mean, I mean, the, the only person I can think of who definitely is a 100% guaranteed never do a, to do a cover of Corvair Baby, although no one ever has, the last person I would pitch it to would be Ralph Nader. Jello, could you show some of the records of the corporate sales variety? Because I showed you one and I had kind of like said, purists don't really like that type of yeah. record. Do you have some records you can show us? Well, there, I'm going to show you something else first along these regards, because turns out um, they're not called corporate in sales convention records. It's called, get ready for this one, industrial music, industrial musicals, or just industrials for short. These musicals are still staged. My girlfriend knows good friend of hers who lives in Hawaii and she makes her living performing in these things. And so a um, mainly like a psych and weird people co record collector I knew really well who I did a sidebar interview with for uh, the incredibly strange music book named Paul Major. Um, he was kind of cluing me, and, you know, I know this guy whose specialty is these records. I think you two weird people ought to meet. Oh my God, look at that product placement. I am so grateful. We're even making cups again too. You can actually buy those. They'll reach you even quicker than the LP or the CD version of Tea Party Revenge Porn will and stuff. Yeah, how can you not want to drink from that every day? I mean, we, we're not making goblets because uh, the upper crust didn't want to do a record with us. So we won't make those. But um, anyway, 
So he said he wanted to meet this guy, Steve Young, who was kind of an expert on this. I kind of knew there was more out there from a bootleg CD called Product Music. That was my other name for it at the time that had the Frito twist and some others on it, as well as a song from an American Standard Toilet Company convention, My Bathroom, My Bathroom woman's voice is a special kind of place where I can really be me and dream and cream, cream, cream. And of course, I think it was supposed to mean like cold cream and makeup cream. But of course, to me, it was like I can lock myself in the bathroom and jerk off because I'm sick of my husband. And besides, he's off at the damn convention trying to sell more toilets. What am I supposed to do? You know, that, that, that one just really hooked me. So then I meet this guy, Steve Young, and in order to meet him, I had to go to CBS and go to the Letterman complex because Steve Young was one of the main gag writers for David Letterman all those years. When Dave would hold up some really weird thing called Dave's Record Collection. Had that you was seen stuff, that before? Had you seen that before on TV? I'd heard about it. Um, and that was Steve Young procuring the records. And as he told me, he was running out of weird stuff until he blundered into the industrial musicals. And then he was so hooked, he became obsessed with them like the way you are with Canadiana and 60s garage music and whatnot, or I am with all kinds of things. So he set out to acquire every single one of those records ever made. In some cases, price be damned, and then put together even a book about the whole thing, coffee table book called Everything's Coming Up Profits, which he did with another co-writer and collector named uh, Sport Murphy. I don't know if you can see that, but here's a set from one of them in the bottom. Here's the dancers below a bunch of dollar signs. That's how hardcore they were in these things. But basically what, what he did was he gave me some of these records. And because I had one or two and I kind of realized, oh, my God, I've got two or three of these. And the one for Arrow shirts has great garage rock on it and stuff. I just didn't realize it was an Arrow shirt convention record when I found it in a thrift store in Boulder for years earlier. What the hell is this? You know, this is why even if you can point fingers at Jello Biafra and the others for wrecking the collector market because of the incredibly strange music books, no, we can't find anything anymore. Well, that means you're not really looking, are you? I still find things. I'm all about magic accidents and taking chances and some 45 whose title or the band name seems interesting. I put it on. It doesn't sound anything like I thought it was going to be, but it's really cool. And I'm so into it. My brain starts spinning around and some other melodies start coming into my head. And I, then I lift off the tone arm and start singing the new melody into my handy Walkman and start making chorus bridge or whatever. I so see if if I've got a live one or not. And sometimes those turn into songs you know well from Dead Kennedys all the way up till now. Magic accidents are really, really important. Sometimes I get really cool riffs in my head just imagining what I think a record I've read about that I'll never be able to get because it's rare or something might sound like you know, either from past, present or future or whatever. And even then sometimes the song is good enough, I use it. Or I'll remember a song I heard on the radio as an 11 year old and never heard again. And then I realized when I finally hear the record that I remembered it wrong. And my riff is better than the one that was on the radio. Okay, got another song and stuff. There's all kinds of ways to find songs besides hunting for the stuff on a guitar or a keyboard, especially when you can't play them very well. And you can draw from a wider set of influences, thus, my songs sound a lot more different from each other than some other punk associated people. At least I think they do. Widen the base of the pyramid with everything I do, including the Mojo Nixon and New Orleans Ranch and Soul All-Stars records and the rest all the way down to, I think, you know, that might be the first closest pure garage rock song, Last Big Gulp. So you actually got some of these records from Steve? Oh, yeah, including even the holy grail for me. The bathrooms are coming. My bathroom, my bathroom. And because it was late 60s, there's a, uh, I got to get my old man glasses out for this. Um, 
You know, there, there were people who made their living doing these too, including future people who moved on like uh, David Hartman, Valerie Harper, Loretta Swit was in these. Um, Tony Randall was in one as Tony Randall later. I think that was for Pizza Hut. Yeah, and Martin it's, revolu it's revolution. Yeah, there's a whole, you know, it's the toilet revolution. Look at the graphics and everything. Revolutionary plumbing. Look at this tub. The ultra bath is another song. Behind every man is a woman is another song. After all, most of the women were at home and it was male salespeople. And uh, yeah, so uh, anyway, I actually got that from him as well as a double album from General Electric called uh, Go Fly a Kite about the story of electricity, including multiple attacks on environmentalists in here. As Steve put it to me, his favorite ones were the ones that were not meant to be heard by anyone outside the company. You know, I think we have the devil here. We have some other stuff. And somewhere, I don't think I'm going to find her specifically, Valerie Harper is in this one somewhere. Yeah, Where did he not... get the record? Did he have several copies to give you one? Like, why well, did he yeah, release I mean, he, his he copies? Obsessively, anything that popped up on eBay, he would grab it. And he finally realized that what, either he or Sport Murphy, who did the book with him, realized that for eBay, they kept having one counter bidder that they were fighting with all the, over with all these records. So then they met each other and the, the rest is history. The some used record stores know enough to take these in if somebody brings one in. Most of them don't. Occasionally you'll find one in a thrift store, but for the most part it's garage sales or eBay or an occasional, but if the record store is hip, this is gonna be a lot of money for the damn thing too. And uh, yeah, bold new breed it says. This is the Arrow shirt one. I was talking about. So they're really into like sounds of the 60s. You want to get our psychedelic cool shirts and that kind of thing. And uh, speaking of not being heard outside the company, boring artwork. This is a later one from, uh, oh, it's even got like a ventriloquist with a tiger. That's the Exxon Tiger, which they retired when they weren't Enco or Esso anymore. But this, you get things like uh, the... <laughs> The Exxon dealer's wife. The Exxon dealer's wife who washes his uniforms, the gas station, she washes all his uniforms, keeps all the books, cleans up the gas station, cooks all his food. The Exxon dealer's wife. That's what the little woman is supposed to be. That was rather demented. And then you get... Why did Jello, did they stop making these records? Why did they stop making them? Because they just figured online, computer, I don't know. I don't know if there's CDs either. I mean, there's rumored to there's rumored to be an an Enron one, but nobody's ever found it. I mean, it the only the only people who possessed them were people who either got them at the convention if it was in a they did it in a recording studio ahead of time, or they got the live recording of the one time only performance of the show in the mail. This one live in San Francisco. The Coca-Cola Company presents, uh, there they are, all of us. Oh, yeah, here we are. I got to hold this one back. Look at that thing and stuff. There they are for their captive audience who has to pretend they like it or the boss is not going to be very pleased with them. And there's one song on here called The Big Bottling Plant in the Sky. The Big Bottling Plant in the Sky where there's no EPA and there's no OHSA and everyone has to drink Coke all day and more. This is the mentality of these things and stuff. And then a few years later in San Francisco, 1986, the Pepsi convention, solid gold and everything. And the opening song, which is about a 15 minute semi-classical prog music epic is them gloating over the failure of new Coke. Where did the money go that was used to go into these productions? What happened to all the money? that went into the productions well it was it was you know maybe promotional advertising expenses keep the executives happy motivate them to sell more and then they'd break off and do their little seminars this is a little more blatant also from general electric songs to sell by 
And there it is in the book because uh, basically I don't have my copy of it anymore. Unfortunately for me, you know, deal with Steve was, you know, if I found something he really wanted that he didn't have, then <laughs> I had to fork it over to him. So then he calls me up label. There was talk about doing compilations of these on alternative tentacles, but getting the rights was just ridiculous. And Rhino didn't even want to deal with it or anything because you'd have to go to Coca-Cola. You'd have to go to General Electric who wouldn't want the public to know they were ever doing this stuff, especially when people were laughing at the whole concept of them later and everything. Some of these were big budget productions. Like one year in the 50s, I think Fiddler on the Roof took $450,000 to bring to Broadway. Same year, General Motors did their convention musical for $1.5 million. It was only performed once. So then Steve gets a hold of me. Hey, I'm cashing in my chits. The Letterman show is over. I'm going to do a movie about these records. For example, the composers of Cabaret were also at the same time working on a Ford Tractor Convention musical to pay the rent while they were trying to get Cabaret done and things like that. There's also other composers who specialized in these and made dozens, if not hundreds of them, and never knew whether they ever went to record or not, and most of them didn't. So ultimately, the movie, where he also interviews Don Bowles about his records on that regard too, which you can get, you stream this on Netflix too, it's called Bathtubs Over Broadway. And now, because they got the whole budget and everything got it together, now they at least could release some of the songs on this double soundtrack album. And again, the same thing. There's people singing along on the uh, corporate sales convention stuff because Steve had gotten together with one of the composers that he interviewed for the documentary. A couple of the main ones were still alive. And one of them, he took his guitar to the guy's house and they composed a song in this style together, which meant the world to Steve and probably the composer too was used to not getting recognition or anything. It might've been the one who brought Steve up a ladder into an attic where there was just piles and piles of sheet music and programs from these things, all of which were of ones that Steve hadn't even heard of and the like. The sad part of the movie is it's on camera where he repossesses that General Electric record from me. And the worst part is when I heard it, I thought, oh my God, this is even more demented than the bathrooms are coming. This is the greatest one of these I've ever heard. It's so twisted. And so singing Satan is messing with the electricity system, all kinds of other things, but Steve didn't have it. So now it's that rare, apparently. So now he's got one and, you know, he's getting on camera and then he shows him sitting down at home to listen to it in the movie and whatnot. So then that picture I just showed you where I open up the soundtrack album, um, that was choreographed to close the movie where Steve's song is performed, including people who were in the movie in one way or another. Including, Did you make any friends that day? Like, was it hard to convince you to participate? It's amazing. Oh, not you at, at all. The end. You, it, it was easy to get me to participate, but little did I know that the first day before we got to work later on, because we had to record the song the night before so they could get a rough mix together to broadcast for us all to lip sync at the Warner Brothers lot the next day. And so waiting in line at this kind of Asian fusion-y place where you order stuff, you get a tray and you go to your table. And then a smaller woman taps me on the shoulder, looking up at me with a weird ass maroonish red wig and stuff. It was obviously a wig. And, and you know, she was, you know, because of the period, she was by a decade older than me or more. And she looks up at me, my bathroom my bathroom oh my god it's you <laughs> and yes steve had found her and found another woman from the cast of the bathrooms are coming and the two were good friends back then but had lost contact with each other so on camera not only does steve meet them in a hotel lobby they get to see each other again and one of those this was your life kind of things they're so happy and stuff 
so then, um, you know, we record the song and I thought I'm never going to get another chance. So I got somebody on my, on my phone to shoot me and the two bathroom women singing the, my bathroom song again into a recording studio, Mike. I mean, hopefully that'll get into any kind of bonus tracks thing if the DVD ever comes out or something. Right now they're just streaming it on Netflix. But then you, I think, know what movies can be like too. Hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. Okay, we got this camera angle on you. Now we're shooting this and then we're gonna set up for the other one in about four hours from now. And so they give you little trailers to cool your heels, twiddle your thumbs, sleep, or in Don Bowles' case, drink or whatever. So who all winds up in a trailer together, getting to know each other? Me, those two women who are very spunky old ladies, I must say, very proud of their work. Do we just had the greatest time doing them? And uh, me, the two women, and Don Bowles were cooped up in a trailer with each other for hours. And there's very little of me in the final version because they had professional show choir singers and dancers, and one of whom, when we're walking, like, oh yeah, I do industrials for a living. That's what they call them, industrials, industrial music. And uh, there we are marching down Main Street. They cast me as the psychedelic plumber. What were you wearing? I was wearing a black and white polka dot shirt and some really cool shades that somebody stole later at a GSM gig on the Canary Islands of all places. And um, I think I got my little black leather hat on too for the thing, as well as marching with a plunger down Main Street following the show choir. Don Bowles is surrounded by all these comely women and stuff for his part. And, uh, and they even have two other people come out. I think one of them might be Sport Murphy because it's Main Street. Of course, there's a record store with records on the street that they want you to buy. And it's all lined with some of these records. So you see that go by too. Bathtubs over Broadway and Jello. You have some more records too. There's lots of records behind you, but there's some more records behind you that are special to me because you sent them to me, some of them to cheer me up, didn't you? That was to cheer you up when you had your second stroke and I found out you were hospitalized and you know, you are a dear friend of mine and I was worried about you like a lot of people were and just, you know, just what can I do for him right now? Oh, I know. He thinks he's seen the weirdest records ever made. No, he hasn't. He gets subjected to some of these. So I, I put some on the bed, took one phone pick, and one of them is blocked because the cat got in the middle of it and stuff. That was Blaze Star Kitty, who was no longer with us, but uh, she got in the middle of that one. Well, you originally said you wanted to start with American Whitewater. And Till still in this day, you know, people who say that all the good records or the weird finds are gone, they don't look carefully enough in thrift stores and they don't take enough chances. I was like, oh, here comes another loser bar band, but I always grab these unless they look too hopeless. Almost every single one has Proud Mary on it, for one thing. This is the date for a lot of these. And uh, there they are on the back too, American Whitewater. Uh, I better get the old man glasses back out if I can find them. Without Where did you find them. that Jello by Afro? Where did you find I, that it, record? I'm guessing it was in a thrift store. But when they, they, and where? I have no idea. They, um, you know how it is. You'll find something cool. You buy it for the express purpose of playing it when you get home. Then you're busy when you get home and it might not get played for 20 years. So uh, anyway, um, they're live at the Red Blazer. Are they going to tell us where the Red Blazer is? Concord, New Hampshire. That's where they're from. And that's probably where I found it too in that very state. Unlike a lot of these, it is an autograph for the people who happened to be at the lounge bar that night and saw this fine cover band. They do Johnny Be Good, Wine, Wine, with Brown Sugar, too. My God. Usually it's more like Killing Me Softly with his or her song. Well, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of that kind. Leroy Brown is on a ton of them, too, including this one. This one, they actually, they do Proud Mary, but they have it as a medley with another overly covered song by these bar bands namely joy to the world. So like the term industrial music, there's kind of a um, 
controversy now where people like Paul Major think of like lounge music as being stuff like this. He's into these too. But um, of course, lounge music after the incredibly strange books came out was meant more like, you know, Martin Denny, exotica music, jazzier, cocktaily things, some of which is quite good, of course. And uh, so this is the other side of lounge music, which makes this one better than a lot of them is not only do they do stuff like brown sugar and light my fire the singer sounds like a baritone vibrato version of brian ferry he has a really unusual voice for somebody in a bar band who's just trying to get people to buy more chicken wings and pay attention to them instead of the silent football games or whatever. But uh, the voice on here is something. It's kind of like it's a little bit lower pitched than Brian Ferry, which makes it kind of halfway between Ferry and Hino, basically. But this, again, is a bottomless pit. And most used stores will not take these in. Who the hell's gonna buy this thing and whatnot? So thrift stores or Evil Bay or Discogs are your best bet to find who is appearing nightly. I think I found this at a flea market in, in um, uh, Syracuse, New York, but Joe Savage, there he is appearing nightly. And Paul Major considers this one to actually be one where the like some of these every once in a while you'll find one that is either so incredibly bad it's great for that reason like cops limited from yakima washington a singing police officer group who do hands down the worst cover version of johnny b good ever among other things and they're trying to look like a teenage big gang one of them has switchblade on the back and they're cops but anyway this guy what do you know he does macarthur's park apostrophe s and uh, there's some originals on here, Black Magic, followed by Dixie Time, followed by Locomotive Breath, followed by Alone Again Naturally covering Gilbert O'Sullivan. You get the idea here because sometimes every once in a while, you'll get one that's got an edge of dementia or something to it where people like Paul Major and others think this is actually a really interesting record or and you Paul get Major one. also put out a book, Homemade Records. It's an amazing book, isn't it? That one? Yes, enjoy the experience. Yeah, yes. yeah. There's some of these, like the one I just I showed I think you, I actually gave you that book. It's possible. I don't know. In our 2013 it, so. interview. Again, you're watching the Nardwar the Human Serviette show, my 14th interview with Jello Biafra. I think I gave you that book in 2013. Yeah, I mean, they expanded into other kinds of homemade dementia, some of which is very beloved, like the shags you see up there. And I have a lot of these, actually. The one up there, the JNC trio with the really sexy woman from the lounge in the Ozarks in Arkansas or whatever. She does, they do an original called Voodoo Doll. And they do Funnel of Love by Wanda Jackson and some others. That's a genuinely good record. And Xenogenesis in the middle, that's another, um, you know, wannabe religious cult guy with all kinds of writings and sayings that make absolutely no sense. I don't know that row, but then the bottom row, I know about Damien and the Criterions. Of course, Gary Wilson, who somehow got in here, even though he came later and he was known in the new wave world and now performs again every once in a while and is a cult figure to this day. Like I, uh, that DJ Peanut Butter Wolf has been a big champion of Gary Wilson. Oh, there's Robbie the Werewolf. They found, they got him in there too. You know, that's not a loser lounge record. That's like a demented horror novelty folk record from the early 60s that sounds like the cramps at times and stuff. That's an incredible record. Ethel Delaney album here. Here's Ethel with her bus and everything. Ethel Delaney is good. Ethel Delaney is hardcore, old school country, all private press. She's a master yodeler, among other things. She's... Uh, you know, a multi-octave yodeler all in one song. But, and I Jello, don't care. Do you have some more remember. records there in your lap? Yeah, I can't, remember, I can't remember if that book also includes the band Jokers. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know about the Runaways and whatnot. Well, they were before the Runaways, so there. And uh, here we have the new relations. And uh, the kicker is with the title, notice the guitars on here. They call them their mufftars because they are made with mufflers. And I only can think of two other bands, Tar, the Amphetamine Reptile Band, and that, that later band Neptune, who made guitars out of metal like this. Although they weren't using found mufflers, they were more supposed to look like guitars. And uh, yeah, there they are on the back. I mean, needless to say, the Muftars are the coolest part of this band, to put it mildly. Two brothers and great vibes with the Muftars is the title. They, they give you uh, my way, she's a lady, funny how time slips away, but they do bebop -a they do uh, Wooly Bully, and many more. But, and they're uh, respected in the community, aren't they? They were interviewed years later. Like people remember the mufflers. Well, somebody did because here, a full feature, I just happened to be in Kansas City when this turned up in the Kansas City Star. Man, can he play that muffler. And sure enough, it's the one of the two brothers who's still keeping the faith after all these years doing that stuff with his muftar. The other guy left the business, went on to another life. And of course, guess where he's doing his thing? Possibly to this day, Branson, Missouri. Jello, so there were a lot of independent records around before punk. There were tons of them. Well, I mean, I mean, punk came out at a really, really down time. The major labels had consolidated, and decided we have enough of this protest stuff, enough of this heavy stuff, except Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and before them Steppen will sell so much. We'll put up with that. But what we really want to steer people towards is soft rock, adult rock. I mean, even people who used to kind of rock like with the birds, now they're Crosby, Stills and Nash. FM rock, adult rock. And I, a little bit younger, didn't relate to that at all. But the point being, the beauty of punk was it didn't just blow all that dumb stuff out of the water and bring back the spirit of rock and roll. That would be new wave when it was still an umbrella term that included everybody from DOA to Blondie to whatever. It was all new wave and it was all punk before the majors decided, okay, we're not going to do punk anymore. 78, last one was the Dickies in America on a major label till who's could do. But then uh, if you want to put on a little necktie and dance around and sing about the radio, then your new wave and you're okay. But anyway, the, the independent record came back and people were starting their own labels again just to get their stuff out, which was part of the beauty up until all the consolidation and dumbing down of the music and, oh, you want light shows? Sure, how about some disco and stuff? And we can even sell you horrible double knit clothes, just we want your money. But basically, you know, that we were still at a point, even in the 60s, where a lot of the cooler songs were on independent labels like Liar Liar by the Castaways was on a local one called Soma in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. And, uh, and even the 50s, like there were all these stuff that was all on the only record on that label that went anywhere or the only song that band made that they put out, you bring back the seven inch, the single, and it was all album rock by 75, 76 of them, all album rock. You bring back the single as a single, a band that only has one or two good songs, record them, put it out, then write more cool good songs. And sometimes your first song will be your best song. Like again, Liar Liar by the Castaways. I know you know it well. Liar Liar, Pants on Fire, that one. Um, that was 14 year old kids forced to be in a band by their stage parents. They didn't even want to be in a band. And the drummer wrote that song. 14, straight out of the gate, they did that. They did a couple more records later that weren't interesting at all, but that, that got on the radio and everything, like just like the Moonrakers did in the Denver area when I was listening to stuff back then. So uh, there were independents that got some kind of nas national distribution, but then slowly but surely there was less and less and less, not as much less like major label stuff or major label 
artists as there are now, but even labels that were big ones like MGM had all kinds of cool stuff. Then Mike Kerb became head of MGM and announced publicly he wanted to get the label more in line with President Nixon. And who gets dropped but Frank Zappa, Velvet Underground, they just picked up the seeds and then they got rid of the seeds. And their big tax write-off scheme, because they were late to the gate with Summer of Love San Francisco stuff, they decided to sign some bands and call it the Boston Sound and hope all those bands tanked so they could lose all the money as a seven year in a row tax write-off. It's a bad investment. And to their horror, they had Beacon Street Union, Ultimate Spinach, and God, who is the third one? Orpheus. And um, to their utter horror, Ultimate Spinach and Beacon Street Union started selling. Not so much that they were gazillion selling records and the Boston sound is viewed like the San Francisco sound was, but enough that it ruined their tax write-off and stuff. That was the source of that is Klaus Floride who was living in Boston at the time. Anyway, so, but so even then, so there was no more MGM involved because Curb put it all into the Osmonds. And so people didn't think in terms of putting out their own records, except it turns out people were, but nobody knew because there were no distributors for it or anything. So there are all these bar bands, I was saying, who could only sell those records off the stage or maybe one store in their hometown doing it for them as a friend. Otherwise, you never knew it existed. You would get bands like the Great Pretenders who were big enough in their own little realm, wherever it was, they had their own bus, which is illustrated on the front, but there it is for real on the back. And there they are, yet another one who's doing a, there's a Chuck Berry, there's, oh, feel a whole lot better by the birds. That's not a common one for this. Six days on the road. And do you want to dance in Louie Louie all on the same side and stuff. The great pretenders are back, says the marquee. Rock and roll because there was all kinds of circuits for this thing, small towns, small bars, who knows how many bands there were like this in New Jersey or Florida alone. But that's not the great pretenders you wanna know. You wanna know this great pretenders. And you can barely see the frog on the front or the little pictures on the back, but this is a 70s lounge band where you look closely, one of the old Northwest Whalers is in the band, as is on piano only, Jerry Rosley from the Sonics. I noticed Larry Peripa's signature yeah. on that. Yeah, well, basically, from the Sonics. I guess, yeah, I guess he was in it too, or he wouldn't have signed it. Yeah, I mean, I, I got him to sign some stuff. I don't. Can you do show that, that but, record again? But that was the. Uh, but that was the Sonics. So I go get my record signed because they were such an important band in my life. The minute I heard, the first song I ever heard of theirs was He's Waiting. And a minute and a half into the song, I knew they were going to be one of the best and most important bands I would ever hear. What so did that great. sound like? I know Larry did Charlie Natunas. What did that sound like? Well, here they cover Sea Cruise. They cover Hand Drive. Of course, they cover The Great Pretender. They cover Jailhouse Rock, Granny's Pad, that old instrumental from... By the Viceroy's. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say Jimmy Hanna, but you're right. Um, Summertime Blues. It's mostly 50s E things. And um, Jer when, when I showed this to Jerry, and I wonder if I'm the only person since then who ever asked him to sign one, and he just looked at me and got all warm. I had so much fun playing in that band. And the so-called Sonics reunion of that time, the one that Bomp put out, that apparently, according to them, was a con job where another band who's kind of a hard rock band calling themselves a punk band called The Invaders got Jerry to sing along with their covers of some Sonic songs and then never even asked him before putting it out as a Sonics album on Bomp one of many horrible things that got done to that band over the years that, uh, you know, thankfully they overcame the bitter experiences enough to enjoy their comeback and set a world record for longest time between album releases of any band, 50 years. And uh, so it was great to spend a little time with them and hang with them at the Debocha Reno Fest Festival in Reno where I got them to sign the records and stuff. And, you know, very quiet, humble guys. And, you know, the bass player had some, you know, kind of, you know, conspiracy theory stuff going on, but not the extreme right-wing type. He knew the kind of stuff I knew about 
you know, what went on behind the Iraq evasion and drug running with Codergate and stuff like that. So he and I actually ran into each other in a 24 hour restaurant in the wee hours too. So we hung out then. And so then uh, you can imagine both the honor, but the nervousness when they came through and played at the Fillmore and they had one guest per show and they asked me to be the guest. We did money. We did the, the, their cover of the Barrett Strong song that the Avengers also do. So I was kind of hoping we could get Greg Ingram or even Penelope up there too, but they wanted one and they knew me. So uh, there it was. It was kind of neat watching these older guys who'd been doing all these other things in life. I think um, sax player was a fighter pilot at one point and we didn't discuss politics <laughs> and, uh, and um, Bob Lynn. And uh, Jerry said, well, I asked Jerry, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I was helping run a paving company. And you know, th th that's stuff that they did. I think the only one who was going to punk shows and grunge shows in Seattle just on his own and not really flaunting who he was, was Larry Peripa. So he kind of had at least some finger on the pulse of what was going on. And, um, you know, and when I saw him in the little left, little bar in Reno for Debosha Reno. I was right front row at a fucking Sonic show and stuff. That was so cool. Larry's guitar sounded like Larry's guitar. And Dusty Watson, the drummer based in LA who they used, he had that drum thing down and didn't try to show off or change things or whatever. He had their thing down and drove the whole band. It, it, was, it was great. And, and if people um, are wondering, Jello, I'm speaking to Jello Biafra. I'm Nardwar, the human serviette. Speaking to Jello Biafra live from your house, and you have a whole bunch of records you're going to show, right? Winding up here. Yeah, well, I, I had to reminisce about the Sonics at least a little bit because that that they were the Sonics. What can I say? You love them too. You know, oh, you amazing. Do. I did not know about the Pretenders at all. I knew about Charlie and the Tunes, Nobody but did. I, Nobody did. I mean, I'd ask all kinds of other Sonic files. They didn't know about it either. I mean, that guy, an old friend of mine who sadly we've lost him too, Phil Irwin, you know, from Rancid Vad and Alcoholics Unanimous and wrote both books and columns under the name The Whiskey Rebel. Oh, he right. Just he showed me that in his living room and he and I said had such a loose trading thing. It was kind of like, who can top what I got from this person last time? I got to top this and give him this the next time. The culminating one was Phil's when I got him hip to Simon Stokes. He, he got so into Simon Stokes, he got Jeff Clayton, his best friend from Andy scene into Simon Stokes. And then they started a Simon Stokes cover band called Conqueror Worm. And even finally, we found Simon Stokes and he came out of the woodwork. They had a festival, I think it was in Kansas City, and I got Simon to come out doing the Simon songs with Conqueror Worm. We just lost Simon Stokes within the past two weeks, by the way. And for those who don't know about Simon Stokes, speaking of other great obscure records and stuff, next to the Stooges, he was the most non-flower power kind of guy who came out of the 60s. Out of LA, a lot of stuff about bikers, although he didn't ride, and really graphically violent lyrics at times. Oh, that wasn't the only kind of lyric he could write and write exceptionally well. But, um, you know, the knockdown, drag out domestic violence fight going all the way down the stairs and stuff, that is a scary song. And Ride on Angel Ain't Far Behind and uh, Big City Blues, <laughs> which he recorded three or four different times. But, and Simon also has a rip your head off raspy voice and stuff. And it's not Cookie Monster stuff. He has quite a range on it too. You know, kind of like, a, I don't know, a I don't know, a nastier, more cranked up, more evil version of Gary Floyd from the Dicks or something might be a, a loose comparison. We were never able to figure out a way to pry Simon stuff away from dear old Mike Curb and MGM and then the other one from CBS, Simon Stokes and the Black Whip, Whip Thrill Band to do a proper reissue of it. So he just keeps getting book bootleg now. So you can imagine my thing, oh my God, punk has happened and here Iggy's back and Rocky Erickson's back, Cy Staxon, Pink Fairies, all these people that, do, that I really liked are doing cool stuff again 
where's Simon Stokes? God, considering those lyrics, I wonder if he's in jail. But then years later, I find out, no, no, he's not in jail. He just went into writing songs for movies, had a restaurant or two and did all these other things and was still making music. And then he produced an album by Timothy Leary and another by Russell Maines from the American Indian Movement. Anyway, he crept back into our scene after a while too. And so I finally meet the guy and he turns out to be this super sweet, nice guy really just an amazing, he turned out to be an amazing friend. So for a while, the ritual was, he'd come to my spoken word shows or one of the Guantanamo School of Medicine ones. And no matter what everybody else wanted to do, me and Simon would go out to Jerry's or some other place, just the two of us and catch up on all kinds of things. You know, there's a very Zen kind of shamni spiritual thing about him by then too, just an amazing guy to know. And he was much older than a lot of people too. He was something like 86 when he died just now, which put him well into his 30s when he was doing Simon Stokes and the Nighthawks, where uh, they even had one guitar player that Simon kicked out because he was hanging out with a guy named Charlie. But even that was enough later that when they busted the Manson family over the Tate and the LaBianca murders, they arrested Simon too because they thought he might be connected with them, which the only connection was he threw somebody out of his band for being connected with them. Although they obviously knew those people and stuff. So um, the, he, he was in, he, they, they, find, they let him go after a couple of days, but uh, the guy, had, there's an ugly things interview with him from a couple of years ago, where there's all kinds of stories like this from the incredibly live life of the incredible Simon Stokes. Yeah, Jello, Ugly Things Mag has an amazing profile, as you mentioned, on Simon Stokes. People should check out Ugly Things. It's amazing. Yeah, you really want in-depth reporting by somebody who knows what they're doing, or a lot of writers who know what they're doing. It's a deep read. If you want to know about any band, Mike Stacks can tell you everything about them. And so uh, I'm really glad they did one on Simon. It was a British guy, Gray Newell, who did the interview, and he interviewed me about him too. I think that might be a sidebar. It's somewhere in there as well. There's uh, album number one, the MGM one, Simon Stokes and the Nighthawks. And uh, I think about all he did was the graphic design there, but the cover's credited to Cal Schenkel, who did all the Zappa illustrations. And you are Jello Biafra. Jello, anything more on Simon Stokes? Yes, actually. I mean, yeah, he's been on my mind a lot lately because I I knew we were about to lose him, but still, you know how it hits you when somebody's gone and stuff, even if he lived a very full, successful life as a great human being. I mean, the Ugly Things piece even has a picture of him all tightly coiffed with grease in his hair and everything before he was in music trying to become a movie star and stuff, because he's from Boston originally, thus the accent he had when we talked to him. But also a little bit after the ugly things are kind of around the same time, actually, I got a call from Todd Westover, who was one of the drummers in the Bell Rays over the years and graphic designer for Hot Rod Magazine and drums and a million other bands, including the later Simon Stokes stuff, where he didn't like come out and open for the Melvins or something, which might have widened his audience. He was like, oh, Jelly, you should come down. I'm going to play the key cup. I'm opening for David Allen Coe because Simon was more of a country guy, or so he thought by then, still with another version of that always very soulful voice, which was still largely there when Todd's told me, look, you know, he said, you might know Simon's mind is starting to go a little bit. He's repeating himself and whatnot. Why don't we do a show for him? A celebration of Simon's life. As he put it to me later, usually they do this after the person dies. Why not do it when the guy's still alive and he can enjoy the whole thing? And he found through lots of research and stuff, I think all the guys in the Blackwood Thrill Band came back. And then there's some guest guitarists and Todd was playing the drums and whatnot. And Simon's children, his wife were there and everything else. And they wanted me to be one of the guests and sing some Simon songs. Just like, you know, the Sonics, only more songs. 
but we came for rehearsal and everything. And that was another big thrill for me. And aside from Simon is Butch Seneville, who's the guitar player on both Simon Stokes and the Nighthawks and stayed on to the Blackwood Thrill Band. And he is to Simon what Ron Ashton was to the Stooges. That distinctive and that uniquely cool a guitar player. Turned out he was teaching school in the Phoenix, Arizona area. He comes out, so I actually got to rock on stage with Butch fucking Seneville, too. Had he lost his skills? No, he had not. It was amazing, even though it was very kind of thrown together, kind of more like what you'd expect on one of those lounge records. But we go to the rehearsal, and then Simon comes up to me and looks me right in the eye. Jello, this is the greatest day of my life. You know, and it was very touching to know that this was touching him so much and we could give back for him and all. And so then we actually do the show in front of people and stuff. And um, Gwen from the Pandoras was there and many of some of Spindrift showed up and many others. Um, next Spindrift is on Alternative Tentacles, by the way. Watch out for that one. And um, you're going to want to do him, them for sure. But anyway, um, so what it turned out to be was Simon would sing when he wanted to sing, which in some cases meant that he would just decide partway through a song he wanted to join in. And his mind was such that he might do a verse that we had just done or not. And a lot of the time it was me or somebody else. Terry Reed was there too. They were old buddies. And um, they... Uh, they kind of Simon would sing when he wanted to then if Simon was taking the lead you kind of steer him back where the song was supposed to go and then uh, move on to the next song and stuff and um, it, it was it was a great night for everybody we we're all so glad we did that and in the end it may have gone on and off of several different rails and sets of tracks but a good time was had by all. Well, thank you, Jello, for all these amazing memories of Simon Stokes. You still have quite a few records to show me. I think we we'll back probably with part three. Are you okay still for time <laughs> for part three? Where else am I going to go now? You're like a Wesley demon in my head. And there you are on my Zoom screen and whatnot. Yep, we're going on to part three. So stay tuned right now. Coming up. Part three, Nardwar versus Jello by Oofle. Afra! Yeah!